Let's go to Isaiah chapter 49. We're going to Isaiah chapter 49. And we sang, or you heard Dean singing this evening, It's Got to Be God. And there was a line in there, something about God cares for you. <laughs> it's got to be God. Have you ever thought about that in the ministry? So many things that have happened in your life and other people's lives, signs, miracles, and wonders, and things that you've seen. Where else could you go and see the love of God manifested in people's lives so greatly as you see it, not only here at the International Headquarters, but any place where there's a group of people gathered together that love God and love His Word, and they're not afraid to have a good time. <laughs> That's right. You know, John was talking about dancing or something the other night. Um, I've been with groups where they're down on dancing. Well, if you want to dance, you go dance. See? Now, me, I don't want to dance so much. You know, I just dance once in a while, I guess. <laughs> like I say, I change feet quite a bit. <laughs> I like it once in a while. Well, anyway, where are we? Dancing. <laughs> Enjoying life. If dancing's enjoying life, then go out and dance, see? As long as you dance in the spirit. <laughs> if you enjoy doing something and it's not contrary to the word, why not do it? I've seen so many Christians, or so-called Christians anyway, who are afraid to enjoy life. That's right. Well, God didn't make Life so that you could enjoy it less and less. He made, he, Jesus Christ came that you could have life and have it how? Yeah, that's right. Spiritually, mentally, physically, materially, every way. He wants you to enjoy life. I think it says something like that in Timothy. <laughs> Where is that in Timothy anyway? Second Timothy or first Timothy chapter six, first Timothy six. Verse 17, there it is. Charge them. And this isn't an army. <laughs> Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in what? That's right, because so many times people get caught up in the material things and start trusting in that rather than trusting in God. But they start trusting in the material things which are uncertain. You can't guarantee what money or anything else in the material realm is going to do for you. But I can guarantee what God and His Word is going to do for you. It says, don't trust in uncertain riches, but in who? The living God, who subtracteth from us. No, who giveth us a few trinkly little things. No, He giveth to us what? All things, all things, richly. <laughs> not a poverty God, richly to be sad about. No, to do what? To enjoy. Isn't that beautiful? All you do is trust in God. Put God first, and He's going to give you all things richly to do what? God doesn't want you to have a miserable life. He wants you to enjoy life. And I want to tell you something. When you get into the Word, Get into power for abundant living. When you start manifesting the greatness of God's love and His power in your life, God just keeps pouring it on you. He gives you richly all things to enjoy. And you start enjoying life. Yeah, I know the devil kicks up his heels once in a while. That's all right. We still enjoy life. Amen? You bet your life. Now we go back to Isaiah. And the reason... You can enjoy life just as much today as you, you, or even more than before you got into the Word, is because God cares for you. You heard Dean sing it tonight. Right. God cares for you. In Isaiah chapter 49, and in verse 14, it says, But Zion said, Incidentally, Zion is Jerusalem. Zion was the mountain. Now, can a mountain talk or a city? No. It's a figure of speech where the city or the place is put for the people that are in it. That's right. See, when it fails to be true to fact, it has to be a what? Figure of speech. See? Zion said, that would be like 
if I said, and New Knoxville said. Can New Knoxville talk? No, it's the people that said, see? And here is that same figure. But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me. In other words, the people of Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. And my Lord hath forgotten me. Wait a minute. <laughs> is that God's word? No. That's what the people in the town were saying. They said, God has forsaken me. He's forgotten all about me. God doesn't know I'm here. The people maybe left God, but they had their vocabulary turned around here. God hadn't forgotten them or forsaken them, but that's what they were saying. Then in verse 15, he puts it this way. Can a woman forget her sucking child? Could a mother forget her nursing infant? Could she? I think not. That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they might forget. <laughs> a mother could forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Can you imagine a mother forgetting her sucking child, her infant that she's nursing? Forgetting the child? I can't imagine that. But he says, some will, but I will never forget thee. God's even more unforgetful than mothers. I think that's beautiful. Then look what he says. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy walls are continually before me. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it is when you understand the Orientalism behind it. I have engraven thee. I have engraven thee, or I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. The graven on the palms was a tattoo that was put on the hand, the palm. In the Eastern culture, they would put a tattoo on their body of someone that they love very dearly. In the Western culture, you know, you put someone you love in the while you're in the Navy or something, I guess, don't you? I, or maybe something you don't love. I don't know. You just put a thing on. Sometimes you put your girlfriend on there. But, or maybe she's not your girlfriend. I don't know. But I know this. That in the Eastern culture, they would put something of that person that they love very dearly. They would tattoo it on their body. But you never put them on the palms of your hand. Because it was very painful to tattoo on the hand. Because when you tattooed on the hand, you had to go very deep in order to make it stay. Whenever there's a tattoo put on the hand... It has to be done very deeply. But yet God so loved us that he tattooed us on the palms of his hands. That's how much God loved us. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only, do you think that hurt? God so loved us that he says he's engraven, he's graven us or tattooed us on the palms of his hands. Now, of course, that has to be the figure condescensio because God has no hands. He's spirit. But it's a figure of speech giving a human characteristic to God to explain his great love to us. He tattooed us on the palms of his hands because of his love for us. And then it says, Thy walls are continually before me. Those walls were the palms of the hand. Because every time he would raise his hand, there you are. Every time he raises his hand, you're there. You're constant. Do you think God's going to forget you? He tattooed you on the palms of his hands because he loves you and your his the walls, or what does it say? Thy walls are continually before me. 
There you are in the palms of his hand. You're constantly before him. How can he forget you? A mother may forget her child, but he says, I will never forget you. You're constantly in front of me. That's how much God loves and cares for us. We're engraven on God's palms. In Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, that's tremendous. But when you read it from the Greek text, it has a double negative. I will never, never leave thee would be the emphasis you could utilize to put on. In other words, I will absolutely not leave thee. It's a double negative in the Greek text. And then the next one, nor forsake thee, is a triple negative. <laughs> If you really wanted to read this for emphasis, you would say that God hath said, I will never, never leave thee and never, never, never forsake thee. That's how emphatic it is in the Greek text. If God has engraven us on the palms of his hands, he loves us that much that he would do that. He's engraven us that deeply. And our walls are constantly before him. The palms are constantly before his face. He'll never forget us. I will never, never leave thee and never, never, never what? Forsake thee. Because we're right there in front of him. God is our father. We are his children. Do you think he would forsake us? Look at the next verse. So that we may reluctantly say, oh, that we may what? Boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And that's where the period should be in the Greek text. It, that's where it is in the Greek text. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's the Lord is my helper and I will not fear. Period. That's where the period goes. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. Well, if God never leaves us nor forsakes us, but we're constantly in front of him like the palms of the hand, then I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will absolutely not fear. I cannot fear. Why should I fear? Then the rest of the verse is a question. What can man do unto me? What can man do to me? I always like the illustration Dr. Orwell uses of the watch. If you want to know how this watch works, you know what you do? You sit down in your living room and you have a conversation with your watch. You say, watch, how did you get here? And the watch answers back. I don't know if he goes in this great a detail, but this is essentially, you know, what people do. Well, watch, how did you get here? And the watch answers back. Well, I started as a mainspring. And eventually I evolved into a mainspring plus a few other working parts. And finally... A glass cover came over the top of me in this evolution process. And in my particular species, there even came the days of the month in a little slot here. <laughs> now, you want to know how it's made? Go ask the maker. Right? Right. Go ask the fellow that made it. You want to know how you tick? <laughs> what makes you tick? You go ask the one that made you, God Almighty. That's right. 
And here's his book. That's his word. Tells you all about it in here. Now look, man comes along and he says, boo. Well, God comes along and God's on your side. He'll never leave you nor what? You're engraving on the palms of, on the palms of his hands, right? He'll never leave you. <laughs> never, never. And never, never, never what? So that I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid. I shall not fear. What can man do to me? So you look at that man, you say, boo back. <laughs> that's right. Boy, that's the word. That's right. What can man do to you? Absolutely nothing. When God's on your side. With God, there's more power in your life, more love, more ability to help people. The world comes and goes. Goes. The grass withers, it says in the word. But the word of God, it abideth how long? Forever. God's word abides forever. Man's word abides not so long. Maybe a few thousand years at the most, if they happen to have it written in the right book. And the right people carry it on. But it does not last forever. God's word abides forever. It's eternal. That's right. It was in the beginning with God and it endures forever. That's God's word. In Psalms 118 is where this is quoted from, or essentially the same thing that we just read in Hebrews. Psalm 118. We read it in Hebrews where it said that I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I shall not fear. What can man do unto me? That's the way the Greek text reads. But the King James had it a little bit different. In Psalms, it reads just like the Greek text. Psalm 118, verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. And the Lord did what? You mean the Lord answered prayers back in those days? Sure does. Does today yet. And set me in a large place. The Masoretic text reads here, the latter part of that verse, He answered me with the deliverance of God. <laughs> the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Is He answered me with the deliverance of God. Now that's quite a deliverance. Better than the deliverance of man. Here it is, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not what? What can man do unto me? The same thing we just read in Hebrews. The Lord is on my side. And I shall not fear. What can man do unto me? That's God's deliverance. The deliverance of God. Verse 7. The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. The Lord takes my part with them that help me. We all work as a family. Therefore... Shall I see my desire upon them that hate me? The ones that help you, it's going to be great for you and for them as long as you are walking with God. But the ones that are against you, it's going to be some problems, some sorrows. Like it says in, where is it, Isaiah? Someplace. Um, 50, someplace. Where it says something about walking in the light of your own sparks. If I walk in the light of my own sparks, something to this effect, then I'm going to have sorrow. If I walk in the light of my sparks, when the Easterner went out to work early in the morning, it's an Orientalism again, and he carried his rope, and that rope would be burning at the end, and it would shoot out little sparks, and that's what he used for his flashlight. Not too much light. And if he didn't see the edge of the cliff from those sparks, he might fall. He had to really walk carefully. Don't walk in the light of your spark. You're going to have sorrow. Walk in the light of the word. This is like a big bright light. Like the sun. S-U-N. A bright light. Those that walk with God. Those that help you, God's going to help them. He's going to help you as long as you're walking on the word. But those 
who walk contrary to the word, who walk in their own sparks, they're going to have sorrow. I'd rather walk in the big light. If I'm going to walk down a narrow path with deep valleys on either side, I would rather walk in the day than at night. Wouldn't you? Walk in the light of the word. Look at verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord, the one that's never going to leave me nor forsake me. It's better to trust in him than to put confidence in man. Hey, have you ever heard a man say to you, I will never, never leave thee and never, never, never forsake thee? Maybe some of you ladies have at the altar. <laughs> but I tell you, God's a little more trustworthy than even them. <laughs> you may even have a little problem with some of those. <laughs> But with God, he'll, he will absolutely never, never leave you and never, never, never forsake thee. Most weddings, it just goes up until death do you part. See? God, it's never, never. A little different. Think about it. Well, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. How many kings have you ever heard say, or princes, or princesses, I will never, never leave thee and never, never, never forsake thee? Not just a whole lot. Look at verse 10. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I do what? Destroy them. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about. <laughs> Boy, did they compass me about. <laughs> but in the name of the Lord, I will do what? Destroy them. They compass me about like bees. <laughs> you ever been compassed about by bees? You did. You headed for the nearest pond. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You know, if twice establishes it, three times must do something tremendous. <laughs> verse 13 thou hast thrust sore at me that i might fall but the lord he did what he helped me the lord is my strength oh you mean then i don't have to develop all these muscles so i can fight the enemy no the lord is my what it says someplace several places that the lord does your battles for you if you let him let him do the battles for you quit trying to do everything yourself let God do some of it for you. Let him fight your battles. He wants to. Trust in God. The Lord is my strength and he's also my song. That's what I sing about. What do we sing about? Your long lost lover. Hope not. <laughs> you sing about God. See, The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. He's the one that makes me whole. He's the one that gives me strength. He's the one that gives me a reason to be singing again. Gives me a new song in my heart. Got a brand new song. Something. Look at Psalms 55. Psalm 55. <clears throat> God cares for you. All we need to do is trust what he says. His word says he's never going to leave us or forsake us. And in Psalm 55, verse 22, it says, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he shall do what? That's right. You got something heavy on your shoulders? Cast it on him. That's right. Let him carry it for you for a while. Remember, if you're going to travel fast and far, you got to travel how? Light. That's right. If you're going to run in the Olympics and you've got 200 pounds on your shoulders, you think you'll win the race. Odds are tremendously against you. That's right. 
you're going to run that race, you've got to get rid of the burden. Get it off of your shoulders. If you're going to run with God, you're going to win the race. Then you've got to get rid of those burdens. Throw the burdens on God. Cast your burdens on Him. See, He'll sustain thee. He'll give you strength. He'll keep you. And those burdens aren't physical. Sometimes they might be. But it's like your mental anguish. The unrest you have in your heart. Where you're all tied up in knots. You're distraught for some reason or another. Full of fear. Why do you want to travel with those kind of things? Throw them on Him. Because He'll sustain thee. He'll keep thee. He'll guard thee. He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer or allow. The word suffer is allow. He shall never allow the righteous to be what? Just sang it tonight. On my way to heaven I shall not be what? Because God will not allow you to be moved. All you do is trust in God. Don't trust in the arm of the flesh. You trust in God. See it? Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. That was addressed to the Jews, wasn't it? Here you have essentially the same thing in the New Testament. God cares for you. First Peter chapter 5. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Does God care for you? Sure does. Cast all of your care on Him because He cares for you. Don't trust in man. Don't trust in the arm of the flesh or in your own strength. Trust in God. If you've got something, some cares, some burdens on your mind, cast all of your care on Him for He does what? Cares for you. First John chapter 5. Isn't God wonderful? God loves us. And if He loves us, then don't you think we ought to love one another? Help one another? Suppose you have a little difficulty in transferring the care and the burden that's on your heart to God. <laughs> Do you think I, as your brother or your whatever... Spiritually, do you think I could help you to put that care on God? If God so loved me, why shouldn't I love my fellow man to help him? If God loved you, why shouldn't you love your fellow man to help him? That he can cast his care on him and walk light. That he can run the race. Look at 1 John 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is what? Is born of God. Now, it doesn't say he might be someday, perhaps in the future, if he's good enough and has enough black marks and not too many red ones. I used to worry about this ledger God was keeping up there. All the red marks I had. Well, doesn't say that. It says whosoever. And whosoever means what? Whosoever. Terrific. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God provided oh, is born of God. <laughs> All you have to do is believe Jesus is the Christ. Romans 10, 9 clarifies it. It says, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Make Him Lord. And believe that God raised Him from the what? Dead. That's the Christ we believe in. When you believe He is the Christ that God raised from the dead, you're born again. Born again. This time you're born again spiritually. You're born of spirit. The first time you were born of what? Body and soul. You were a body and soul man. 
when your mother and father produced you. You came into this world with body and soul. But when you're born again, when you come to that place where you confess Jesus as Christ, then you have spirit also. Now your body, soul, and what? Spirit. You're born again of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Look, if I love God, then shouldn't I love my brothers and sisters in Christ? If you love, if God loves you, then you love God, you love other brothers and sisters in Christ? Sure. But by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep His what? His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are very difficult. His commandments are not grievous. I'm not talking about the Old Testament commandments. He's talking about the commandments in the church administration. Like, I would that ye all spake in tongues. These things are a what? Commandment of who? The Lord. Sorry. Watch to whom this is addressed. It's addressed to the church. His commandments are not grievous. You don't have to take a lamb down to the altar every Easter or Passover. That's right. That was Old Testament. You don't have to do all the sacrifices. Or if you touch somebody that's dead, you don't have to go through the cleansing ceremony of seven days or whatever it is. You don't have to keep all those hundreds and hundreds of laws. His commandments today are not grievous. They're not a yoke of bondage like the old covenant was. Love one another. Speak in tongues like crazy. That's modern translation. Right. Walk by the Spirit of God. That we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Verse 4. For whatsoever or whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Our believing. <laughs> Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is God. Oh, sorry. That believeth that Jesus is what? You bet. That's what it says. I didn't write it. Neither did you. Praise God. <laughs> Who believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? When you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then it says you overcome the world. When you're born again of God's Spirit, you're one that overcomes the world. We overcome the world because we are born again. We've got everything spiritually that we need. And you'll overcome the world in your walk as you walk by that Spirit and the Word of God. That's right. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Look at verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He came by water and blood, not by water only. Water is indicative of his physical birth, you know, the physical side of him, the body. And the blood is indicative of his soul life. He was body and soul, because the soul life is in the blood, Leviticus says. He came by water and blood, not by water only. He wasn't just body, but by water and blood. He was body and soul. And it is the Spirit that bears witness. Now look, Jesus Christ had body and soul. When he was baptized, he received what? Spirit. The Spirit descended on him when John baptized him in the river, remember? When you and I are born the first time, we have body and soul. And when we confess Jesus as the Christ, we're born again of God's Spirit, then we have body, soul, and Spirit. And the Spirit bears witness. It is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. Because it's eternal. Sorry. The flesh is a fact. The body and soul part of you 
will terminate. It'll die. But the Spirit is truth, and that's what bears witness. Now you're ready for verse 7. For there are three that bear record. What's it been talking about? Body, soul, and spirit. The water, the blood, and the spirit. The rest of these words in verse 7 and the first part of 8 are not in any of the Greek manuscript manuscripts except a few of the late ones. Very few, like four or five, something of that nature. There are three that bear record. The words starting there, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. All those words are not in the Greek texts, manuscripts. It should read from verse 7, for there are three that bear record. Then you go down to verse 8. The Spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one. What's it been talking about in the context? Body, soul, spirit. The Spirit, the water, the blood. Now he gets down here to verse 7 and 8 and he says, there are three that bear witness or three that bear record, bear witness. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now watch. Before you were born again of God's Spirit, you had only body and soul. You were a body and soul man. Did you have a spiritual connection with God? No. But when you confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus believed God raised Him from the dead, you were born again and then you receive spirit. And it's that spirit that bears witness. So now you have three, and these three agree in one. They are working together. You're one unit. Can you separate your spirit from your body? Or your soul from your body? <laughs> Take it out and go on a trip? No. Sorry. Get into another field in that when you try that. Your body, soul, and spirit. And now these three work together as one. They agree in one. They work with a unity of purpose. The greatness of their working in a unity of purpose is when you speak in tongues. Because God's Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are, what? Sons of God. And if sons were heirs, Join heirs with Christ. As you speak in tongues, you have the proof in the senses world that you are born again of God's Spirit. You've got body, soul, and spirit bearing witness. But it's the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. But you're a three-part man now, like Steve Sands. You've heard that song. You may have to work that, but boy, that, that verse 8, 7 and 8 there, leaving out the part that's not in the manuscripts, is real beautiful in the context because he's been leading up to this where you were only body and soul. And when you receive that spirit, you're now a three-part man. And you've got the witness, the proof in the senses world that you are a son of God. These three agree in one. Verse 9, hey, before we go to verse 9. If you have that spirit bearing witness that you are a son of God, like it says in Romans, how does that spirit get its information? Does some man tell it? comes from God, doesn't it? God teaches your spirit, which teaches your head. That's right. God teaches you by the Spirit. Now, if man comes along and says, you're not born again of God's Spirit, but the Spirit says you are born again of God's Spirit, which do you think is right? <laughs> God or man? 
Look at verse 9. If we receive the witness of what? Men. The witness of God is what? <laughs> Which do you want? What man says or what the Spirit says? The witness of God, it says, is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness where? Right smack dab in the middle of himself. <laughs> spirit. And you manifest that Spirit by speaking in tongues. He has the witness in himself. The proof in the senses world that you are born again of God's Spirit is when you can speak in tongues. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Boy, isn't that something? These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you may know that you may what? No. Not argue about, not dispute over, but that you may know, be absolutely convinced that ye have what? Eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He says you've already believed on the name of the Son of God. If you've already believed, then you're born again of God's Spirit. Now look, your body, soul, and spirit. You've got that spirit. Can you speak in tongues? Do you have the proof then in the senses world that you are born again of God's spirit? That's what the word says. When you've got that proof in the senses world, then you know that you're a son of God. And you know you have eternal life. And when you know that, you can continue to believe on the name of the son of God. Boy, what a witness. What a God that would care so much for his children to leave them such an intimate witness. Your witness is not the Ark of the Covenant. That's not your witness. Your witness is not, what do you want, the temple in Jerusalem, which isn't there anymore. And surely not the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> the Mohammedan trip. Your witness is not something in the material world where you have to trust what somebody else says. Your witness is when you can speak in tongues and you can manifest that spirit, you know you've got it. And nobody can take it away from you. That's how much God loved us and cared for us to give us an intimate witness. Look how much he really does love us. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence, the boldness, the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Our God hears us. When you ask anything according to his will, God's listening. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We absolutely know. If God hears you, then you know that he's absolutely going to give it to you if it's according to his will. And how do you know his will? By knowing his word. When you know God's word, you know his will. When you know his will, you can walk victorious life. You can ask God for anything according to that will. He's going to hear you and he's going to answer your prayer. And the proof that you have in the senses world The proof that you have in the senses world that you're born again of God's Spirit is that you can 
what? Speak in tongues. When I speak in tongues, God's Spirit is teaching my mind and I'm speaking it forth. When I speak in English, <laughs> nothing. If somebody else speaks to me in English, what do I have in the senses world? What kind of proof of anything? Yeah. What do you want to speak to me? You tell me the Reds won the last game. Cincinnati Red Lakes. What does that prove to me? Nothing. But when God speaks to you, when you're speaking in tongues, it's a perfect prayer and it produces results. It's the proof in the senses world that you're born again of God's Spirit. Boy, I want you to see the greatness of that. Don't let anyone ever talk you out of that. That's the Word. That's what the Word says. It's not what man says. I don't care what man says. What do you want to trust in? Man's Word or God's Word? And if this isn't God's Word, then what in the hell can you trust in in plain English? What can you trust in? You certainly can't trust in the arm of the flesh. You can't trust in yourself. I've tried hundreds of things that I failed in when I trusted in myself. But when I tried the Word, it worked. That's right. When I try sense knowledge stuff, it doesn't work. The principles of success that are outlined in everything, what it says in the Word, I mean what it says in those principles, you can find them in the Word, if they work. That's right. Was that that convention this morning and, and yesterday? Natural foods, the principles of the natural foods are found in the Word because the same God that made the spiritual laws made the natural laws. See? If He put the natural laws in effect, He put the spiritual laws in effect, then they ought to work in alignment and harmony with each other, shouldn't they? That's right. The success principles you read in, in a lot of the, you know, the secular promoters, the motivational techniques, when they're successful, you can read them in the Word, line by line. Human relations principles, you read them in the Word, line by line, when they work. See? In all of the, the Eastern religions, the principles that work time after time, the same principles are here. Except they don't have a Savior that gives them eternal life. They have the, sens the secular sense knowledge, natural principles, but they don't have the spiritual principles that are in the Word. They understand a few of the, the spiritual laws, like believing, and some of them operated, but they do not understand the greatness of God's Word and Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That's what makes the difference. And God's Word great? And that witness you got inside great? You bet your life. 